Bienvenue à la session scientifique du département de médecine familiale de l'Université d'Ottawa. Nous sommes réunis aujourd'hui à partir de nombreux endroits différents et dans un espace virtuel. Mais nous désirons commencer par reconnaître les terres sur lesquelles se trouve le département de médecine familiale de l'Université d'Ottawa, qui font partie du territoire traditionnel non cédé du peuple Anishinaabe algonquin. Nous vous invitons à réfléchir à votre propre emplacement au Canada par rapport au territoire où vous vous trouvez aujourd'hui. Nous reconnaissons aussi les gardiens des savoirs traditionnels, jeunes et âgés. Nous honorons leurs courageux dirigeants d'hier, d'aujourd'hui et de demain. Kakina Anishnabeg Undaje Kaye Ugug Kakina Eneagizijik Ene Kukamikak Kanadang Eje Udapina Gig Endawajin Udawang. We are gathered today from many different locations and in a virtual space, but we wish to begin by recognizing the land on which the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Ottawa is located, which is part of the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. We invite you to think about your own location in Canada in relation to the territory where you find yourself today. We also acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. Uh, my name is Dr. Shauna Bassel. I'm one of the staff physicians, as you heard, at the Riverside Family Health Team, um, and then the postgrad unit director there. Um, I'll let Tom introduce himself as well. Sure, and I'm uh, Dr. Tom LaRiviere. I'm uh, one of the second year residents at the Riverside site. And as you heard, this was part of my FMRSP uh, supervised by Dr. Basil. I bullied him into it is the answer. Uh, all right, um, so what we wanna talk about today essentially is, oh, I can't, there we go, all right. Um, so uh, we want to talk to you uh, a little bit uh, today about the pre-residency boot camp that um, we piloted this year. So uh, first of all, I think let's talk about our project goals starting out. So the goal of this project was essentially to be an introductory workshop for incoming family medicine PGY1s um, to kind of orient them to things that uh, they might require for their upcoming rotations and for their residency. So skills and requirements uh, that are commonly needed. Um, now you know, coming into residency is a really scary time. You're a student for your whole life. And then all of a sudden, overnight, you're a doctor. And so that obviously can come with a lot of anxiety and a lot of apprehension and a lot of new things to learn. Um, and so really, we wanted to provide this uh, in order to make residents feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, we wanted to tackle topics that they felt they might have benefited from uh, ahead of time that uh, students transitioning into residents really could, uh, uh, could thrive and learn from uh, in order to better prepare them to start residency. And so our primary goal is really for the learners here in this boot camp, but our secondary goal would also be to kind of broach the subjects that staff and supervisors feel and um, learners tend to struggle with. So uh, as supervisors, as preceptors, uh, we all have learners uh, that have been a difficulty for a variety of different reasons. There might be some common themes that you tend to see over and over again. Um, there might be some things, especially at the beginning of residency that come up. Um, and so there are a lot of things that don't make it to, you know, DRPCs or uh, more formal remediations um, that we deal with in our clinic all the time. So that would be a secondary goal of this project. Um, like anything, I think whenever you're starting a new project, you have to sort of ask yourself, you know, do you need this? You know, is there a practice gap? Is there something to act on? Is there some QI to be done in this in this uh, in this realm? And so um, I think where this was bred from primarily is, as we all know, due to COVID, I mean, uh, there's such a variety of training environments and training experiences. Um, our residents come from all over. There's IMGs from all over the world uh, that trained in a variety of different um, environments, a variety of different times. You know, some have trained 10 years ago and been in practice in different settings. And um, we have CMGs that are local from Ontario, from outside Ontario within Canada. We have Canadians that have an, an understanding of the healthcare system, but have trained outside. So um, I think 
a lot of our learners come from all different walks of life. Um, and that alone would um, probably change in terms of their uh, capacity and their exposure prior to residency. Um, but then you add COVID in, right? And so COVID really changed the game. There were a lot of people who really had minimal access to patient care, maybe uh, actual um, patient interactions. There was a lot of virtual care and virtual care meant different things for different people. Um, and so uh, we really felt like um, because of COVID, uh, especially, um, but even prior to that, there was probably some differences in terms of things like exposure training and knowledge that residents are coming in with. Um, we for sure know that location of training defines resources and healthcare access and a healthcare system is different provincially, nationally, internationally. Um, so we, we certainly acknowledge that that can affect a learner's readiness to start a Canadian or specifically an Ontario family medicine residency program. Um, and I think also very importantly is that this boot camp and the intention of this boot camp is really to support our competency-based curriculum, right? So we want to prepare our learners for today's healthcare environment. We want to prepare our learners based on competencies uh, learned and earned and not necessarily just a, a skill set that we expect them to come in with or their capacity to have already learned certain things prior. We really want to um, talk about the competencies that we uh, would like them to achieve during residency and how to best set them up to learn and to succeed. So uh, we performed a needs assessment, uh, kind of a multifocal needs assessment. So uh, we surveyed both residents and then preceptors as well. Um, you know, luckily at the Department of Family Medicine, we have a really, really wonderful uh, wealth of, of information and surveys that have already been done and feedback um, and documentation of resident experience. And so we were actually really lucky that we were able to draw on that. Um, we uh, sort of looked at our confidence surveys. I was able to uh, sit down and, and look through data for confidence surveys of the last few years. Uh, we looked at our exit surveys and looked at what residents had mentioned they perhaps wish they had more exposure to uh, their experience in PGY1 versus PGY2. Um, we did some polling at academic day as well. So to get more of a whole cohort feedback on things that they wish that they had known um, prior to residency or things that they wish that they have had, they would have had exposure to. Um, but essentially we kind of surveyed them. So we sent out and I'll show you a, a survey and just sort of ask people, you know, what do you wish you would have known prior to starting? Um, what are some things that you wish you would have had exposure to? What did you feel unprepared for? Um, and so just gaining feedback from our current residents, uh, both PGY1 and PGY2 as well. And we also asked our chief sites and all of our, um, our chief residents and all of our site chiefs for more informal feedback. And so they kind of asked around and uh, we were able to gather a bunch of information from that. And we also surveyed our preceptors. Um, so we asked them, you know, what are the co most common things that PGY1 struggle with? Um, what are the things that you find you're teaching yourself over and over again? What are the uh, learners that struggle um, and that maybe don't make it to those more formal remediation exercises? Um, we targeted preceptors both in outpatient and inpatient, so we really wanted a variety. Um, and then we were able to go through things like the DRPC minutes, um, re remediation discussions, and really understand what some of the most common things uh, or subjects were that came up. Um, so this is the survey that we sent out. Um, so essentially, we sent it out to both residents and staffs just with some tweaks. And um, this is the staff one. Um, but essentially, we asked, you know, what are the three things you wish residents would have known or had exposure to prior to starting residency? And um, we really kind of made it a blank slate. We didn't want to target the survey too much because we really wanted to hear we were kind of starting from zero. And so we really wanted to hear what they had to say. We wanted to see what kind of topics and subjects came up. Um, we also asked, you know, describe what you felt residents or for residents, describe what you felt you may have benefited from prior to starting training in each of the following categories. Um, so the big categories, we all see documentation, presentations, uh, being on call, which I think is a huge, huge one. Um, procedures and consent. Uh, so procedures was something that we we toyed with whether or not we wanted procedures to be sort of a part of this boot camp and just for the purpose of this year, uh, it didn't really make sense, but something we could consider in the future. Um, and then we just said anything else, right? So the point of the survey really was just to gather as much data as we can and, and hear your feedback and hear resident feedback and then really try to tailor this to the needs of, of, of uh, who we're targeting here. Um, so uh, we, we got quite a bit of feedback. Um, so uh, we're gonna tell you a little bit about that. Um, so 
just looking at some staff uh, surveys. So we got about, I want to say 20 responses, maybe a little bit more for each of the surveys. Um, but we also got quite a bit of, as I mentioned, sort of informal or informal survey feedback. And so these are some of the things that came up quite a bit and some of the recurrent themes that came up. Um, so things like office workflow, documentation, um, how to send consults, um, things like uh, administrative tasks, um, things like navigating social aspects of medicine, um, LU codes prescribing came up quite a bit um, and an introduction to that. Um, debriefing on cases, adverse outcomes. Um, also, you know, how to process uh, difficult um, scenarios or, or cases where adverse outcomes had happened and how to sort of improve and take those as learning experiences. Um, breaking bad news was something that came up and that actually came up both in the staff and in the resident surveys as well. Just an introduction to having that conversation and being the primary provider having that conversation. Um, how to use the EMR. So that came up quite a bit and we'll talk a little bit about that, but I think that's always a question for everyone, even if you've been using your EMR for years and years. Um, obviously different sites have different EMRs and so we, we couldn't really um, explore that fully, but we, we wanted to see how we could introduce the EMR. Um, so prescription knowledge was something that came up quite a bit, uh, especially prescriptions for, um, for narcotics and for limited substances. Uh, patient-centered interviewing and agenda setting. Um, navigation of the Ontario healthcare system was something that we saw, uh, just especially for people that were not only from out of province, but from out of Canada, and that was a big question. Um, thorough SOAP notes, uh, how to include a differential diagnosis with management plans, um, and then different types of presentation models. Uh, so things like five-minute presentations, elevator pitches, things like that. Uh, in terms of our resident survey, so this is just some of the feedback that we got. As I mentioned, there was quite a bit of overlap with our staff. Um, so once again, EMR training tips from a resident's point of view. Um, people wanted to know about forms, so driver's medical, death certificates, um, dealing with difficult patients, and also that feedback about breaking bad news and having goals of care, having care um, discussions about consent, having advanced care planning. Um, mental health and addictions resources in Ottawa was something that came up quite a bit, and so we were very mindful that um, our residents seemed to want resources that would be beneficial to them in the immediacy, so dealing with patients within um, their area of practice. Um, social supports for newcomers and people with disabilities as well. And I just thought I included this because I thought one comment from a resident was basically exactly our, our intention, which is they thought it would be really helpful to kind of front load training to give core skills early and then maybe to consider a fresher course at the end of the first year. And I thought, hmm, is he planning my next steps? Uh, so I thought that was a good thing to include, but sort of confirm that we are sort of on the right page and that maybe this is something that residents are interested in. Perfect. And so as you can see, we drew information from a number of different sources uh, to try and identify what we wanted to include in the boot camp. But I guess that left us with a number of additional questions. And primarily it was, okay, we know the what, but how are we going to do this? Um, and so, you know, not, not only how are we going to do this from a standpoint of how are we going to create our boot camp, but then I guess as, as an extension to that, how are we potentially going to make this publishable? Uh, so one of the first things that we asked ourselves was how do we feasibly create this boot camp? Um, and, you know, I guess in order to do that, we had to look at what was done before or what was done previously. So two of the things that we uh, we were aware of and that I think a lot of people are aware of are the Queen's University Family Medicine Boot Camp, which is a one month boot camp uh, at the start of residency for the residents in family medicine at Queen's, uh, gives them a, an opportunity to gain exposure kind of longitudinally. Um, and then I guess in addition to that, in Canada, there's also the University of Saskatchewan postgraduate medical education one week boot camp. Uh, so we looked at these. Uh, there was a lot of anecdotal information from these sources, uh, but they actually, you know, in the literature, there hasn't been any sort of publishable data or any sort of publishable results. So using that as a bit of a rationale, uh, we thought, why don't we extend this further to, you know, all of the literature and not just family medicine, but all other subspecialties as well. Um, you know, as we were talking about, there was thoughts as to whether we were going to in include procedures in our boot camp. Um, and a lot of these other boot camps have been more geared towards that. A lot of sub -surg uh, surgical subspecialties uh, with less of an emphasis on some of the other specialties uh, in medicine. However, uh, we wanted to include that because it just, you know, would give us more information about what's been done before. 
And so we'll get to that slide in a second, but basically, you know, how do we feasibly create this bootcamp? Uh, do we focus on a one day versus a multi-day versus a month long, like the Queen's University bootcamp, virtual versus in-person? Um, some of the literature that I found, you know, due to COVID, uh, boot camps became quite prominent in the past few years. And so they had to modify their delivery approach. And some of them were actually successfully able to deliver one or two day virtual boot camps. Uh, as I said, procedural skills versus a general orientation. As you saw, most of the topics that we have identified don't actually have anything to do with procedural skills, but nonetheless, very important things to focus on uh, coming into residency. And then I guess, you know, in addition to that, the assessment modalities. So what have these papers actually done in terms of a needs assessment? And then what sort of pre and post exposure uh, data have they collected and how have they analyzed it? And then I guess lastly, you know, obviously the cost and the resources, uh, factoring that into our decision for, you know, how we can feasibly create this. So if you want to jump to the next slide. Um, I just highlighted here uh, the papers. So we actually, in addition to looking at what's been done before from our own standpoint, we got a, a medical librarian involved. So Maria Cecile uh, was able to help me out and we identified nine papers, as I mentioned, throughout North America. Uh, focusing on all subspecialties who introduced some sort of a boot camp pre-residency. Um, so I've listed them here. I'm not going to go into you know too much detail about what they all say. If anybody's interested, I can provide some of these papers. But um, in essence, you know, at their core, they all were trying to accomplish what we wanted to do, which was establish a boot camp, run it in a manner that identified uh, pre-exposure confidence mostly in a subjective way. So uh, participants giving feedback about uh, how they felt they were prepared before the boot camp and afterwards. As I said, it was done in a different number of modalities. So virtual versus online, as well as uh, one day versus multi-day. Uh, but all of them, uh, all of these papers were able to identify significant increases in preparedness in at least some of the domains that they focused on. Um, and so we thought that they were good, uh, you know, rationale for our boot camp. If you want to jump to the next slide. So, you know, the ultimate goal is to publish our information. Uh, but in order to do that, we have to make sure that we're using the appropriate uh, data analysis and not only that, uh, you know, analyzing it, analyzing it in the right way. And so we got Dr. Doug Archibald involved, uh, had a number of conversations with him, specifically focusing on what sort of modalities we were going to use to assess our information. And then not only, you know, generally assess it, but what we were going to do from an analysis standpoint. And so um, what we decided on was using subjective feedback, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, and basically, once we have that subjective feedback, we correlated it with numerical values using a Likert scale. And that was uh, that basically allowed us to analyze the data. So with all that in mind, we performed a multi-step needs assessment to identify what we wanted to include. Uh, we did a literature review and spent a lot of time figuring out how we were going to include it and how we wanted to structure our boot camp. And then in part for feasibility purposes, you know, what we decided on was a one day boot camp. Um, and you'll see the structure below, but uh, what we, you know, the way we decided to deliver it was a combination of didactic teaching, uh, afternoon workshops where uh, residents or participants were able to kind of choose what they thought they needed to learn the most. Uh, and then we also provided some handouts as well. And perfect. So this is a lot of discussion, obviously, with the DFM and our wonderful team at the helm of uh, curriculum and and um, and uh, postgrad orientation. And so um, the one day sort of seemed to make sense in terms of what we were able to provide and what made the most sense uh, in terms of what we think might be able to deliver uh, or achieve our goals. Um, so essentially, we decided to do some uh, whole group sessions in the morning. Um, the idea of doing these whole group sessions and having them be longer sessions is we picked out subjects uh, based on the feedback and based on some of the um, uh, the assessments, but also the feedback directly from residents from preceptors and some of the um, documented feedback that we had things that that came up often and um, things that people really uh, felt either they struggled with at the very beginning or things that perhaps preceptors felt residents or learners could sort of brush up on um, some of 
the main topics that kind of came up over and over again. And so we thought it would be helpful to sort of provide these longer whole group sessions um, uh, as sometimes refreshers and sometimes sort of introductory workshops. So uh, documentation, uh, things like, you know, how to do a, a SOAP note, which I think is fairly intuitive for most learners, but not everyone, depending on where you trained and how long ago you trained. Um, things like an HPI and how to actually document that appropriately. Um, very importantly is things like return to care instructions, um, uh, how to write things like admission notes and discharge notes, um, and, uh, and basically documentation, uh, both in the inpatient and the outpatient setting. Um, then we had a, a whole session on presentation and handover pearls, uh, so a variety of different presentation models um, with some sort of smaller group or sort of um, uh, that residents in smaller groups could sort of play off each other, uh, things like SNAPS, uh, things like SBAR, things like the one minute preceptor, um, and then handover just in terms of, you know, what that means, uh, both in an inpatient and outpatient setting, uh, in an acute setting. Um, and then consent and advanced directives. Um, so uh, how to gain consent, how to consent someone for a procedure, um, how to uh, declare death and, and what that looks like and what that means, um, how to start an advanced care planning conversation, um, how to uh, define a POA, why is that important? Um, so starting to have those ACP discussions. Um, and then in the afternoon, uh, we actually had workshops. And so the format of it was uh, four workshops that residents could sort of choose from. Um, we had sent out uh, the descriptors of the workshops ahead of time, and residents were able to sign up based on what they thought either most interested them or perhaps what they felt needed the most, uh, um, you know, they needed to brush up on prior to starting the residency. Um, so the workshops that we provided were a prescribing refresher. Um, so this was just sort of a reminder on how to prescribe, specifically how to prescribe for um, certain controlled or restricted substances. Um, uh, and then the second uh, prescribing workshop was prescribing for exceptional access. So this would be, you know, how to find your LU codes, how to check your Ontario drug formulary, um, you know, how to figure out whether or not something is covered by ODB, you know, the introduction of things like Trillium. Uh, so a little bit more in terms of uh, the prescribing opportunities. Um, referral expert is kind of exactly what it sounds. It's how to make a great referral, right? So Kessler's five C's and, and really how to make a good consult, how to make a good referral, how to, how to refer uh, when you know the specialist is not going to reject it. Um, breaking bad news, which is something that came up quite a bit. So having those discussions, uh, um, an introduction to those discussions. And because uh, we felt like this was such an important topic to really have the appropriate lexicon or really to feel confident, um, we offered it in both French and English. Um, and we thought that might be helpful. Um, M&M rounds, uh, so an introduction to presenting M&M rounds, but importantly, an introduction to debriefing as well. So starting to have the conversations about adverse outcomes, how to learn from adverse outcomes and, uh, and, and learning about different types of bias as well. Um, we did put a session on about the use of the EMR, and this was a little bit tricky, as we mentioned, because uh, EMRs are so different depending on where you are working and where you are training. Um, but the intention of that workshop was really sort of an introduction to how can you make your EMR work best for you? You know, how can you manage how to how to uh, organize it uh, uh, in a way that sort of sets you up for success? Um, and then agenda setting and patient centered interviewing, um, which is once again, something that came up through our surveys and something that I think we can all uh, agree is, is a very, very important skill and probably something we review with the residents very often. Um, and so these were the workshops that were uh, offered and residents were able to sign up for four and they were able to sort of rotate through them. They were shorter workshops. And then at the end of the day, uh, and thanks to some advice from some great people, we actually just had kind of an ask me anything panel. Um, and so part of this was we recognized that we're not going to capture the needs of everyone. And we really wanted to give an opportunity for people to ask questions or to clarifications or just to, you know, ask things that might make them feel a little bit more confident, or a little bit more comfortable starting residency. Um, and so we provided kind of this carte blanche, a panel of physicians um, uh, and residents were able to kind of ask whatever was on their mind. And so we really wanted to get the panel full of a, a really great representation of our of our faculty and of our staff. So um, we got uh, physicians from our academic fits uh, and then also from uh, uh, the community from MOFOR, 
Um, we got some chief residents uh, to sit on the panel as well. And um, we had some FMOB providers, some FM uh, eMERGE providers, um, some hospitalists, and then some palliative care providers as well. And uh, I appreciate everyone who was able to join us for that and give their time because that was really, really great. And um, it was very, um, it was really nice to see sort of the questions that came out of that. Um, I very much recognized, or we very much recognized that not everyone feels comfortable raising their hand and asking questions. And so we did provide a QR code uh, that residents could scan and then they could ask their questions anonymously and we read them out to the group. And so um, I think that made the environment really inviting and welcoming and non-judgmental. And it was a, a really interesting thing to see what kind of questions came up. Um, very variety, but you know, some things uh, such as the logistics of a maternity leave in residency or or uh, how to navigate being sick when you're on a certain service and things that you might sort of be nervous about or have questions about that might be maybe outside of the, of the actual learning that we, um, we set up. Um, understanding that we only had one day and that we wish that we could you know, be able to share everything or, or meet all of the needs of our needs assessment. But um, we thought that uh, handouts would be a really helpful way to get some of the information to our learners that they could take forward with them, that they could have as resources. Um, and so we actually made four virtual handouts that were circulated to all of the participating residents um, that they could keep, they could download, they could keep on their phone or on their computer. Um, the first handout was a review of local resources or the Champlain Lynn or whatever it's called right now, uh, or uh, home and community resources, uh, depending on the um, area that you're working in. Um, and some links to that as well. Um, a review of mental health resources. So um, resources that are available online, referral-based resources, the difference between a fee-for-service and sliding scale, um, some self-referral. Um, and so those also came with quite a few links. Uh, and I wanted that to be a resource for, um, for learners to be able to use when they're actually providing mental health counseling or even to give out to their patients. Um, the third handout was essentially just definitions of things like ODSP, OW, what is long-term disability, what do those things mean? Um, I think as someone who trained outside of Ontario coming in as a learner, it was definitely a big, big question for me. And so I just thought uh, perhaps we could eliminate some of those initial questions about what it means when your patient is on ODSP. Um, I know that uh, for the most part, there is a whole social determinants of health lecture, and that goes into that a little bit more uh, in depth, but we thought this handout would be a good introduction. Um, and then the fourth handout, which I think will probably hopefully remain kind of a live document, is a list of medical resources. So not just up to date or Toronto notes, maybe some resources, some antibiograms, how to access things, you know, how to what's available on Epic to pull down in terms of um, guidelines and, and workflows and pathways. Um, and so uh, and so these were the things that were provided to our learners um, ahead of time virtually for them to keep going forward. Perfect. And so now we've got to largely the meat and potatoes, which is what did we actually find? Um, and we've alluded to uh, through our needs assessment, as well as through the agenda that we just outlined, what the actual topics were. Uh, but on the left hand side here, what you can see is the list of the actual topics that we focused on for our assessment. Uh, and so what we did, we distributed surveys before and after the boot camp, um, asking questions pertaining to all of these topics. So basically, they were statement questions, I feel confident or I feel prepared to handle whichever of these it might be. So whether it's documentation or consent uh, to the level of an incoming PGY1 resident, and then asked residents to uh, grade their confidence on a scale of one to five, first uh, as basically uh, subjective feedback. So strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, or strongly agree. Um, and then we converted these into a Likert scale using the numerical values one to five. So strongly disagree was a one uh, and strongly agree was a five and everything else in between kind of fell into place. Um, and so from all of that, we, uh, we were able to get 53 responses in the pre-exposure survey. I believe there was maybe 70 or 71 residents in total. Uh, and not only did we focus on the general cohort, but we also broke this down into kind of uh, categories based on location of training. So IMGs, CMGs from Ontario and CMGs from outside of Ontario. And I've just uh, included an in infographic down here, which kind of outlines the, uh, I guess, breakdown of all the participants. A um, couple things to note on this slide. So this was before the exposure. 
Um, as you can see on the left-hand side, what I've highlighted are the two topics that residents felt least prepared for. So uh, these happen to be prescribing and m and rounds. Uh, and then, <clears throat> you know, compared to that, uh, when I looked at each individual group, CMGs from outside of Ontario, before the boot camp even began, demonstrated consistently higher subjective levels of preparedness, uh, I guess, before we did anything. Um, and I haven't included all of that information here. There's a lot of data. Uh, again, I'm happy to provide that later if anybody wishes to, to see it. Um, but for the purpose of this, we really focused on the general cohort. Uh, with that in mind, however, important to note, uh, IMGs appeared to exhibit lower subjective pre-intervention preparedness in most topics, uh, especially the use of EMR, where their average mean pre-intervention score was 2.2. And as you can see on the left-hand side, the general cohort's uh, use of EMR preparedness level was 3.21. So quite a big difference. If you want to jump to the next slide. Perfect. And so what did we find afterwards? Uh, so what I've included here are the post-intervention scores on the left-hand side. Um, and then right beside that included uh, the p-value. Uh, and I've highlighted in green all of the topics that were statistically significant for increases in preparedness after our boot camp. Um, and this was for the, the general cohort. So compared to the pre-exposure where there was 53 responses, we were able to still get 44 responses after our, our boot camp. Uh, and once again, not only did we look at the whole cohort, but we subcategorized into training background as well. Uh, so as I mentioned, there was five topics with statistically significant changes. Uh, and as you can see, it was advanced care planning, prescribing, referrals, use of EMR, and m and rounds and debriefing. Um, I've just included a little, little point for all of the uh, subcategorized groups here, uh, just for comparison. So for CMGs from outside of Ontario, uh, they only reported significant increases in preparedness in one out of the 11 domains, which was the use of EMR. Um, and what was interesting, uh, again, not included on this slide, but this cohort, after the boot camp, actually had slight decreases in their subjective level of preparedness in five out of the 11 domains. Comparatively, CMGs from Ontario had significant increases in four out of 11 of the domains, which overlapped with all of the uh, significant changes seen on the left side here, with the exception of use of EMR. And that could be because, uh, you know, being from Ontario, already being a little bit more familiar with the EMRs available, could have felt a little bit more confident compared to say some an IMG who's never seen Epic or never seen Meditech before. Uh, lastly, IMGs when compared to the cohort uh, also had five out of 11 significant changes. Didn't quite overlap with what you see on the left side here, uh, but some of them did. And then if you just wanna flip to the next slide, just because I'm a visual learner, I figure some people are as well. This basically just demonstrates what I said on the previous slide. So. Um, what I've done in these red boxes are what the statistically significant changes are uh, pre and post intervention. Perfect. So um, I think, you know, upon reflection, I think we want to know sort of where do we go from here? Um, so what did we learn from this pilot? Well, first off, I think very importantly is um, it's just sort of a first year that we've done it and we uh, are taking the feedback and we're trying to see just sort of how we can improve um, the, what we're providing and what we're offering. But um, I think one of the things that we learned from this pilot is that one, uh, there are big differences in terms of things like preparedness or comfort level with certain um, uh, skills uh, in terms of where you've trained. Um, if you have uh, different levels of exposure, if you are coming from different backgrounds. Um, I think that's something that we knew already. But um, I think one of the things that we learned from this pilot is that uh, certainly we're on the right track with some of these things. Um, there was definitely some improvement in some of the categories that we were expecting and then some surprises in terms of some lack of improvement or even a step down. Um, you know, I think sometimes you can uh, sort of reflect and say, you know, did we provide too much information? Was there an information overload? And maybe that affected scores for preparedness. Um, I think the other component of this and very importantly is, uh, I think we need more information. So um, this boot camp was not mandatory. Uh, it was an optional boot camp. There was optional participation. And as such, you saw, um, we got about 53 participants, which is great, um, not the full cohort. Um, but uh, one thing that we did admittedly is we let them leave without their post-exposure surveys. 
And so tracking those down and, and getting those full, um, that full feedback from pre and post exposure. So we actually only got 44 post exposure surveys. And so that limited our feedback a little bit and our uh, capacity to kind of extrapolate that data. Um, so I think one of the questions is, do we kind of make this mandatory? Do we say, listen, we think we've got something here we want to go forward, but we really want to be able to see whether or not an entire cohort with this pre-exposure sort of workshop um, actually notices more preparedness or uh, whether or not um, uh, we can get more of a, a whole cohort um, feedback. Uh, and, and that's something sort of we're talking about now in terms of uh, combining it with PGME orientation and making it sort of part of that day. Um, I think the qualitative versus the quantitative data is always, always something we're going to struggle with. Um, so in terms of qualitative data, I think we sort of did the best for now, but, you know, can we expand that? Um, is there more qualitative data that we can look at? Um, are there different questions that we can look at? Um, is there a way to get more quantitative data? Um, where can we pull our data from? Um, we really surveyed the residents here, right? So our pre and post exposure surveys and our primary target of this pilot was, was the residents. Um, and, but we talked about a secondary goal, which would be preceptors. And so, um, you know, would it make sense to ask preceptors, you know, how do you feel your PGY1s were at the beginning in the first, you know, two, three months in unit? Did you notice a difference in terms of their preparedness for, you know, X, Y, and Z documentation presentation um, and whether or not um, they felt that there was a noticeable difference as well? Um, I think also uh, including things like um, the uh, confidence surveys, looking at the confidence surveys and seeing if preceding years compared to this year uh, after the pilot exposure uh, changed confidence in the, uh, the first part of PGY1 as well. Um, and then, you know, do we follow up at six months? Do we follow up at a year? Um, how do we make sure that this is sustainable? This is, these are skills that they, that residents really felt were helpful for them and that they really felt uh, changed their learning experience. Um, and sometimes that can be difficult to know immediately after an exposure and sometimes having that reflection um, throughout PGY1 and at the end of PGY1 can be helpful as well. Um, I think also, and this was sort of brought up by Denise Lewis, who said, you know, what about the wellness component of this? And, and I think that's a really, really good point. You know, um, part of this is really trying to make our, our learners feel more confident, more comfortable and sort of getting everyone on an even footing. And, um, you know, one of the questions is, does that actually help from a wellness component, right? Does that make people feel, okay, I'm well supported. I'm well understood. I, I, it's not as much of a question mark starting this program. Um, you know, I feel like I've met, you know, so many people, all this chief residents, I've met my other cohort, and I understand what the program is about a little bit, and, and maybe that can be helpful uh, from a wellness component, just a comfort level. Um, and then also, I think there's a great opportunity, especially with Dr. Tobin and getting the wellness, um, uh, the wellness sort of group involved, um, maybe from a presentation perspective at boot camp to introduce, introduce wellness and PGME wellness, and what does that mean, and how to make sure that our residents know about that, because I I think that's a really, really big um, part of, of, um, of residency as well and going through that experience. Um, and then obviously adjustment of the schedule. So based on the feedback, what can we add to the day? What should we subtract? Um, how do we sort of change this to better support our goals? Um, I think really importantly, and I think we can all agree, you know, one year does not make a, a, a diagnosis, so to speak. So um, I think we need more feedback. I think we need to run this a few times and hopefully not change too many things in order to really be able to determine, okay, what works and what doesn't. Um, but I did take the feedback from uh, last time and we did sort of look at that. And so I've adjusted the schedule for next year. Um, so for example, the prescribing workshops were very well received and pretty much across the board, people felt like it improved their comfort level. The feedback was very, very strong for that. And so we've actually actually taken that whole prescribing the two workshops that we uh, provided and and we actually uh, made that into more of a whole group setting and we also adjusted some of the timing for some of the whole group settings that people felt were a little bit long or maybe weren't as helpful things that they had already known um, and we added a couple of workshop options in the afternoon for things feedback that um, we just didn't uh, have the capacity to do in our day um, so um, just Finishing up, I mean, I like to surround myself by people that are much smarter than me uh, to ask for advice. So just very, very appreciative of every, everyone who sort of helped us get this um, uh, off the ground. Um, and we wanted to open it up to questions, comments, jokes, criticisms, uh, and any feedback that you think can help us make this, uh, this pilot better.
Helena and Thomas, thank you very much. That was a great presentation and overview. A good example of, uh, of an innovation that you've uh, implemented uh, locally um, that can have some outreach.